banners, uh, the kids, if you didn't get to see uh, the Hanging of the Green last week, you can go on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook page, and see them uh, having the Hanging of the Greens, and so it just feels like we're beginning to walk into that Advent season. We still have poinsettias that are for sale for the youth fundraising project. Uh, we have cleaned and cleared off the angel tree, so give yourself a hand. All of the angels have been taken. Now the second half of that is bring the stuff back, so make sure you get it back in a timely manner. The other thing is we talk about giving to those who have need and not just giving ourselves things we really don't need. Our alternative gift market brochure is ready and we'll be supporting our missionaries and all the agencies that we reach out and serve in Christ's name. Uh, the How much This is always a great uh, boost to our missions outreach and this is how we fund a lot of our outreach and support a lot of our ministries during the year. So please take time. It's also a great opportunity to see all the things we do and put faces with names. Sam's done a great job of preparing us with that. As we continue to talk about the holiday stuff, we're looking, they were selling Christmas uh, drive through uh, meal tickets as you came in. We'll be selling them afterwards. Uh, it's $5 a ticket, best bargain in town, full meal. This time it'll be chicken spaghetti. And so uh, if you haven't bought your ticket, do that. Uh, and then just to give you heads up for the next couple of weeks after this week, we're going to have the kids helping us in worship on uh, next Sunday uh, in overflow worship the um, we're gonna or the kids will be doing I think they're singing in both services and they'll come here then exit and go over to overflow last thing and that is we have incredibly musicians leading our program Wes is published and is listed on staff as our uh, music director and, and composer in residence, but Reagan is also a composer, and he and the Overflow Band have done uh, a single that they're gonna release on December 11th, and uh, you're gonna love it, it's Creation Waits. Some of you heard it last year, it's a PC wrote. So watch on Spotify, watch and take that, download it and listen to it. It's an incredible Christmas song. Today's Advent reading is on peace, peace in each step of the journey. Isaiah 40, verse 1 states, Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Isaiah later calls for the people to go up to a high mountain. For generations, people cried out, as Isaiah does, that the paths are crooked, the valleys too far down, the mountains too high. We fear stumbling on uneven stretches of the journey. What if we could see it all from God's perspective, that through it all is the eternal source of peace? Today, we light the candle of peace. Each time you set out on a road or pathway this week, pause and ask God to grant you peace while you're driving to work, walking into the office, or taking the dog for a walk. Remember God's promise. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this church and for an opportunity to worship together during this Advent season. God, whether we walk with purpose or wonder without clear directions, whether we are in a valley or on a mountain top. And now we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
The scripture reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Allison. Let me move my big uh, podium up here. Trying something different today, so that's why I got the podium. Um, well, good morning, everyone, and my name is Sam. I'm one of our associates here, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet. And I also just want to take a, a moment to acknowledge those of us who are watching online. Um, thank you for worshiping with us today, and we are thankful for technology and for the opportunity to extend our congregation beyond these four walls. So as we heard earlier, today is the second Sunday in Advent, and last week we lit the first candle and that symbolized hope, and today we are celebrating peace. And that's what we're going to talk about today, peace. And the peace that I'm referring to is more than just a shallow, worldly, getting along with everyone around you peace. The peace that we're talking about today is the peace that you can only gain through Christ. In our scripture today, the angels and the heavenly hosts appeared and said, this is the joyous declaration that was made right after Jesus was born. The angels are coming and they're saying, peace, peace has come, peace is here. The Hebrew word for peace is called shalom. It's a really fun word to say if you want to try it, shalom. You just kind of let it roll off. But shalom refers to this all-consuming, all-redeeming peace of Christ. It's something that's so much heavier than just the peace that we typically think of. Some people describe it as a little slice of heaven because shalom shows us how things are meant to be. I've also heard some people describe it as a thin place. It's where the barrier between heaven and earth is just so thin that you don't even realize that it's there. It's just when things feel just right. And you're like, man, this, this is what God intended for us. This is how it's supposed to be. That, that's what shalom is. So here on earth, we see little glimpses of shalom from time to time when followers of Christ love God and love others with all their hearts. And as Christians, we should long for shalom in everything we do and do everything in our power to usher it in. So another thing about Advent is it's a season of waiting. We're waiting and preparing for the birth of the Savior. We prepare our sanctuary for, you know, in the colors and the poinsettias and the, the beauty of it. But we should also be preparing our hearts. It's, it's a season of waiting for the Messiah to come. And one of the more difficult things that I personally find about being a Christian is that we're always living in a time of waiting not just during Advent, because we're living in an in-between. We're somewhere between the promise and the fulfillment of a promise. So we've been given this gift. We've been given Jesus and access to salvation and eternal life. And we've even unwrapped the gift, and we get to experience little pieces of it, but we're still waiting for the completion of it, where it will be perfect and even better. So we're living in a world where we know that things aren't really as they should be, and we're longing for the day when God's kingdom will fully come. So what do we do while we live in this in-between time, in this middle period of tension? Well, Scripture reminds us that God desires our faithful living right now. Even though we're in a season of waiting, that doesn't mean that we're sitting around not doing anything. We're called to faithful living right now. And a big part of that includes being a peacemaker. So in reading the Christmas story this week in Luke, cha Luke chapters 1 and 2, I was struck by Mary. And Mary always catches my attention just because I think she's a pretty cool individual. But the story of Mary visiting Elizabeth is probably my favorite passage in the gospel. So we're going to get to that a little later. But while I was reading it this time, I noticed something different about Mary. Mary is a peacemaker. In everything that she does, Mary lives with an attitude of peace. She has it within her own heart, and she's seeking to give it to others. So we're going to look at a few examples in Mary's life today where she demonstrates peace. 
So in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, the angel Gabriel appears to Mary and he tells her that she's going to conceive and give birth to a son, and not just any son, but he's going to be called Great and the Son of the Most High. And Mary's a young girl. She's probably only maybe as young as 12 years old. She's pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, and this means that sexual relations are forbidden at this point in their relationship. So Mary is from a small and significant town in Nazareth, and all of this about Mary means that there's nothing significant about Mary. There's nothing special about Mary, but somehow she is supposed to believe that God has chosen her to bear the Savior of the world. So let's pause for a minute and put yourself in Mary's shoes. Imagine the fear that Mary must have felt and the racing thoughts and the why me's and just the the fear that she must have felt. Yet, in the midst of each of these thoughts, a 12-year-old, a young girl, still chooses to answer, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. So being pregnant before wedlock, that that was a big deal. It really put Mary's entire livelihood at stake. Joseph could end things. He could have her stoned. He could quite literally end Mary's life. So this this was a huge deal. This was probably the most chaotic and life-altering event that Mary had ever faced in her life. So if there was ever a time for someone to act irrationally or to lash out on those around her, or to turn to woeful self, self-absorption, self that's probably, I, those, that's what I would do if, if I were in Mary's situation. But she didn't. Mary received news that, she, that her life will be changed forever, yet she is a picture of peace during all this. She's the calm in the storm, and she's a picture of peace because she believes in the coming Messiah. She's able to to approach all of this calmly and faithfully because she sees the Messiah coming. So Mary graciously accepts what is asked of her and acts as an agent of peace and reconciliation by bearing the Son of God. So the next moment in Mary's life that I want to look at uh, is in the next few verses, chapter 1, 39 through 45. And this is Mary's visit with Elizabeth. And earlier I told you this is my favorite passage of Scripture. And it's because of the friendship and the community and just the love that Mary has for Elizabeth. So the young, innocent, blessed by God, potentially struggling Mary sets out to visit Elizabeth right after she's found out that she's pregnant with Jesus. And not only is Mary demonstrating peace within her own heart, but she's extending peace to others by going to visit Elizabeth. So some things to remember about Elizabeth. She is the mother of John the Baptist. Her husband is the priest Zechariah, and he was also visited by an angel and told that he and his wife would conceive, though they were very, very old. So Mary sets off on this courageous journey to visit Elizabeth, and it probably took her somewhere between three and five weeks to get there. And while she was on this journey, she faced the threat of bandits and I mean, she was a young girl traveling alone, so I'm sure you can imagine how scary this journey was. So in other words, Mary goes through really great lengths to visit Elizabeth. And why did she think it was so important? Well, she and Elizabeth could relate to one another like no one else in the world could right now, creating a significant opportunity to relate to one another. So these are two women who have just experienced divine pregnancies. That doesn't happen to many people. So in the passage leading up to this one, we're told that Elizabeth stayed in seclusion for the first five months of her pregnancy. Can you imagine the loneliness that Elizabeth must have felt to to be pregnant and by herself for five months? And her husband is struck mute, so she, she can't talk to him. I mean, in the third trimester of my pregnancy, that's when we went on lockdown. So I spent maybe... 10 weeks in my house by myself with my husband when I was pregnant and I was going crazy. So I can only imagine what Elizabeth must have been feeling during this. So not only does Mary show up and meet Elizabeth's physical needs, but she also meets Elizabeth's need for a friend. 
and for a companion to share the ups and downs with. So Mary's visit to Elizabeth communicated to both of them that they're not alone in the midst of the chaos, and she used her experience to be an agent of peace for Elizabeth. Elizabeth needed a friend, and she needed someone to lean on during this difficult time. And Mary fulfilled that role for her. Friends, this is what being a peacemaker is. Stepping up and loving others when it's hard. Being a peacemaker is difficult, but it's necessary if you call yourself a follower of Christ. So throughout scripture, we see how Mary has every reason in the world not to be a peacemaker. She's had to flee to Egypt to protect Jesus from death when he was a baby. She had to raise a child that she didn't completely understand. And later, she had to watch her son die on a cross. Mary had her fair share of chaos and hard times in her life. Yet, through it all, she remains a faithful peacemaker. So our very last glimpse of Mary in Scripture even demonstrates peace. In Acts, she's with the disciples praying for the Holy Spirit to come after the resurrection. In this moment, I believe that things are coming full circle for Mary. The difficult times were starting to make sense. She had started by holding the tiny baby Jesus in her arms, but in the end, she realized that Jesus had to hold her. He wasn't just Mary's child, but he was also her Lord. Mary is a picture of peace because she faithfully believed in the coming Messiah. We can do that too, y'all. We can faithfully believe in the coming Messiah, and that can give us peace. So Mary's faithfulness in accepting what God asked of her ushers in the ultimate peace of Christ. The peace Christ gives us, or the peace of Christ gives us inner peace. Because of his work on the cross, we have a chance to receive salvation and the Holy Spirit. The peace of Christ also provides peace with others. We have the ability to put aside our differences for the purpose of building up the kingdom. The peace of Christ allows us to look at others through heaven's eyes and help us see the world as the coming kingdom of Christ. And finally, the peace of Christ allows us to trust God's promises through restful, tranquil faith, despite the dark, scary world around us. It guards our hearts from the devil. It brings us joy. It's a blessing from God, and it assists us in dire circumstances. All of these things are gifts that come with the peace of Christ. So how do we do it? How, how do we live as peacemakers in the in-between when life gets hard and when anxieties are rising? So one of my favorite books is called Liturgy of the Ordinary, and it has a really cool chapter on peace. I've talked about this book in some of my previous sermons, um, and I can't recommend it enough if you're, if you're looking for a new book to read. But the author takes everyday activities and just small mundane tasks, and she relates them to our spiritual life and to how they can deepen our faith. So the particular chapter we're going to talk about today is called Fighting with My Husband, Passing the Peace and the Everyday Work of Shalom. So she uses arguing with her husband to demonstrate how being a peacemaker finds its way into our day, mostly in small, seemingly insignificant moments. As we seek to love those people in our life who are constants, our, our husbands, our wives, our children, our friends, our enemies, the Walmart checkout person, the people in the pews around us, as we bump elbows with these people, we have the chance to be agents of peace. She warns that we often get so caught up in big ideas of justice and truth that we neglect those small opportunities around us to extend kindness and forgiveness and grace. So how often are we the toughest on the people closest to us? How often do we have a tough day and rather than extending peace to our, our family who loves us, we choose to lash out on those people. It's, it's sometimes the hardest to love those that we love the most. So being a peacemaker starts with small conscious deci decisions to love others in the midst of difficult moments. So your husband just missed the laundry basket for the thousandth time this week. Act peacefully and speak in love to him. 
or your grandchild just ignored you again. Act peacefully and show grace. Or your friend just canceled plans that you were really looking forward to. Act peacefully and extend kindness. Peace happens in our small daily choices, y'all. Just like Mary made choices inclined toward peace, we can do the same one small step at a time. So, you know, since COVID, in-person worship has looked a little different. And when people talk about what they miss the most about worship pre-COVID, they say two things. Number one, they say singing. They, they miss singing. And number two, they miss greeting. We miss that opportunity in our, in our service to stand up and to shake hands and to give hugs and run around and pass the peace. That's what this is also called, is passing the peace in a worship service. And early Christians were so focused on making sure that the passing of the peace was a real time of reconciliation that during the passing of the peace, a deacon would stand up and would say, let me get this right. I want to is there any man that keeps strife against his fellow? So a, a, a pastor would stand up and say that. And if anyone could answer yes to that question, they had to go to that person and ha they had to reconcile right there in the sanctuary in the midst of church because we as Christians are called to be peacemakers, especially with one another. And when we pass the peace... We're acting out how we live as believers in mission each day. Peace takes a whole lot of work. Conflict and resentment seem to be the easier route. So we can't seek peace out of our own strength. It's, it's not possible. It's something that we need to pray for earnestly and seek wholeheartedly. So as we leave this place today and journey back into the real world, remember that as Christians, we too can say glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests because the Messiah has come you know Christmas isn't here yet but the Messiah has come he has shown favor to us by sending Jesus to the world and because of that we have an eternal peace so I want to end with a quote um, by the author of Liturgy of the Ordinary Elizabeth Harris Warren she says in the end, God is the peacemaker. It is not simply peace that we pass to each other. It is the peace of Christ, the peace of our peacemaker. Christ's peace is never a cheap peace. It is never a peace that skims the surface or papers over the wrong that's been done. It is not a peace that plays nicey-nice, denies hurt, or avoids conflict. It is never a peace that is insincere or ignores injustice. It's a peace that's honest and hard won, that speaks truth and seeks justice, that costs something, and that takes time. It is a peace that offers reconciliation. So during this Advent season, let us be a people who seek to spread the peace of Christ to all we encounter. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, I pray that you have enjoyed worship today and that you have felt the Lord stirring in your hearts and whispering to you. And as we leave, remember the time that we're in. Remember the season that we're in, that, that hope and peace and love and joy are things that, that everyone needs, not just us here at Heritage Church. So we can be those agents that extend peace to others. Go in peace. Amen. You're dismissed.